This is Pivot Perspectives with Chris O'Byrne, the show that takes you around the world to share interviews with some of the most successful and relevant people on the planet. Hear their stories and get the most important business lessons they've learned on their road to success and get exclusive access on how to implement their success into your life and business. Pivot Perspectives is brought to you by the Strategic Advisor Board and your host, Chris O'Byrne. All right, Daniel Hammond. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm excited. You are my first recording for the TV show. So uh, no pressure at all. As long as everything turns out perfect, you're going to be just fine. <laughs> but um, I, I have a whole bunch of different questions for you because I've talked to you before and I know some of what you do, but I, I do want to dig in deeper to that as well. But why don't you just give me a brief overview of what you do and then I'm going to start asking some questions about what led up to that. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and I'm honored to be your first guest. Um, right now, I have a, a, a practice called business interrogation. And what I do is I go into businesses and I ask them about their biggest business challenge. It's a 20 minute session. It's timed. Um, I have a checklist of things I go through and it's really focused on helping the business owner, get clarity around whatever the challenge is. And then um, hopefully we brainstorm some solutions as well. And sometimes that's uh, solving a problem, uh, untangling an issue or uh, maximizing something new that they're doing that they've never done before. So that is a very succinct explanation because I know there's a whole lot more to it. But what I really love is the story that led up to it. So let's go back to, well, let's let's go back to you graduating from high school. What did you do after graduating? Yeah, well, uh, let me back up just a little bit more because there was a chance I wasn't going to graduate high school. Um, I, I ended up getting challenged by school. Um, I'm a fast learner, um, but I'm not a good student of, you know, doing that schooling. And so that's always been a challenge for me especially um, rote memorization. So biology and languages have, have always challenged me. Um, and so uh, I managed to cram for two years of Latin in three days. I went from the worst student out of 60 students to having the third highest comprehensive final exam, which I needed to pass. So once I graduated high school, um, I played around in college. I went to college for a year and a half. Um, it, it was an extension of the challenges I was already facing in school. Um, and I started working and I really loved working. And so um, I started uh, as an assistant manager at a convenience store when I was 18. And then I moved into, uh, I, I, kept get, I, kept, I kept getting to a place where I had no more growth. You know, and, and I was doing so much work for my manager that my manager wasn't recommending that I have my own store because she kind of liked the fact that I was doing all her work. And so then I, I took over and started uh, assistant manager trainee at a, at a little Caesars pizza uh, and moved from assistant manager trainee to assistant manager in two weeks to co-manager in two months. The fourth month, I was a unit manager. Month 10, I was a training manager stuck again. So uh, eventually I went into the army uh, and I, uh, so I was a little bit older going into the army. I was 23. Um, I maxed out the test and could qualify for anything in the army. I said, what's the hardest thing to qualify for? They said signals intelligence collector. Um, I looked at my options and I went with airborne. Uh, so I was a paratrooper and Spanish language because languages are challenging for me. But I, I did eventually more or less learn Spanish and uh, jump out of airplanes without hurting myself too badly. So what about that led you to where you're at now? Yeah, I, I think you know, I learned a lot of lessons in the Army, and I did four years of active duty, uh, two and a half years in the 82nd Airborne Division. And then I, uh, when I got out, I went into the reserves and became switched over to interrogation, um, as people might, might see that there's an interrogation aspect to my to my life. Um, was so enjoyed the the course so much and was so good at it. They literally handed me a diploma and said, "Transfer to our unit. You need to be teaching this stuff." 
And so I taught interrogation for six years in the reserves. I had a deployment, I had real world interrogation experience. Um, it, it really, I like connecting with people and I also like finding win-win situations. Um, and so even in real world interrogations where you're literally talking to people who you would think would have no desire to help you in particular, I found common ground and, and was a successful interrogator and built rapport with people. I mean, my boss was amazed one day when we walked into the prison camp and some prisoner was like, oh, look, and he starts waving to me. And I wave back and my boss goes, who's that? I go, I have no idea. But that was my reputation in the camp is when I said I was going to do something, I did it. Um, you know, a lot of times like they would ask for things and I'm like, I don't think I can help you with that, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. And sometimes I was able to deliver for them and they appreciated it. And so um, just I had really good rapport, um, again, whether it's getting people to confess to war crimes or sharing secrets. Uh, I even even in my daily life, uh, you know, as I network with people around the world, I can't tell you how many times within five minutes of a conversation, people will tell me, you know, I've never told anybody this before. <laughs> so <laughs> even when I'm not trying to interrogate people, people trust me and and. Um, and I'm honored by that, you know, I, and, I, and I respect that. And I, I, it's kind of a sacred, you know, yeah. it means a lot to me. I, yeah. I would imagine there's, you know, some natural skill involved that made it, you know, pretty easy for you to just do so well in there. But what are, you know, I'll ask some of these questions that, you know, people are going to ask and have probably been asked a hundred times. What are some of the, the techniques that you learned and I'm especially interested in how can we learn from what you learned to, let's say, uh, meeting somebody at a conference and starting up a conversation? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, um, my mom is, has a PhD in biochemistry, and she's a very structured, logical thinker, and I have that. Um, and then my dad is a people person. He, he did training and development. And so I think natural aptitude helps a lot, uh, but it is stuff you can learn. I, I taught interrogation. I saw some people who were horrible when they started off, but mastered the skills, right? And, and I think age also helps. Um, it was harder to train people at 17 because they just don't have the life experience. And a lot of it is, how can I connect with you? Um, at this point in my life, I, I have done so many varied things that, I mean, you can't tell me three things about you that I don't find a direct connection with something I've done. It's just, you know, and so that helps. I would say the first thing is uh, if you truly care about people, uh, that helps. Um, it lets you make a connection with them when you are interested in what's important to them. I, I think that's, that's the key. Really, if somebody is not cooperating with you in interrogation, it's it's because you don't understand their motivation. What do they care about? And and so if you slow down and you take the time to evaluate what is that and then connect it in some way to how helping you will help them, um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple process. And, you know, the more yeah, I guess committed they are because I ended up designing an advanced interrogation and analysis course for the military. And we were really looking at who are those people that are really, really hard to get at. And, but it's still, you know, chipping away at their, at their stories that are lies and getting to what do they really, really, really care about? They're going to, they're going to try to convince you, I care about this, but if you can dismantle that and get to what's below it, you can still um, reach that that level of agreement. And again, it's it's a trust thing. You you you've got to maintain your credibility throughout, right? As soon as I lie to you and you catch me in a lie, really, I it's I find it's easier not to lie because um, that's that's taking up headspace. It slows you yeah. down, and people know that you are. Uh, hedging, right, in some way, shape, or form. Um, I like to speak truth 
Um, I, I told one ha one light, white lie, I would say, in my nine months of, of real world interrogation. And it was because I was caught off guard. I was asked a question that I did not want to give the answer to. And so I hedged. You know, they asked me if I was if I was CIA or Army, and uh, I was an Army reservist, and I said neither. <laughs> so that that was the closest thing, and I'll own it. It was it was a lie, but it you know it was not in my best interest in, interest for them to have that piece of knowledge. Got it. So a lot of um, com looking for commonality, actually caring about the person. Uh, how did you? How do you get below the the surface level stories that they're telling that aren't the truth? Yeah, uh, really, that's uh, the one percent. I mean, really, for most people, it doesn't take much. You, you just need to ask them. You know, what do you what what's important, or or explain a logical reason for why you need the information, and they'll start talking to you. Um, those hardened criminals, I mean, or war criminals or terrorists or whatever they are, insurgents, um, you know, effectively they've been programmed, right? They've been told, you know, I think one of the stories coming out of the first Gulf War, which is not my war, was, you know, they were told that Americans were going to torture them and be brutal to them. And then we're like, hey, you want some food? And they're like, what? You know, this is not what, you know, it, their, their leadership by lying to them made gaining cooperation easy because we didn't do what they expected us to do. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it really, it's usually not that hard. If, if they really hate you, it's a matter of, you know, sort of deprogramming, right? You've got to, you've got to find, find the flaws in their logic and just start disrupting those. Um, and I, I believe that uh, the truth is is the key that unlocks all the doors. So if you can find ways to to explain, you know, if if they hate you, and I'm like, well, I'm a soldier, you're a soldier. We just we're both trying to represent our our countries the best of our ability. You know, how long do you want this war to drag out for your country? I have because I'd like this war over tomorrow. <laughs> You know, don't you don't help me, and we could be here forever. <laughs> you know, so sometimes it's just a matter of letting them realize, oh yeah, he's he's like me, or you know, and and I think in our the values of cultures are very different. Uh, I think that su that surprised people more. I think I I probably had more exposure to that than than some of the people in the military, but. Once you understand kind of their baseline of what what matters in their culture, um, again, it, it's it's reaching out and and caring enough to figure that out, um, you know. And there's things that don't make any sense to me. The value of life in the Middle East is not what we consider the value of life, and 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 uh, you know, casually talking about oh well, if I accidentally kill my you know my somebody's kid my tribal leader talks to their tribal leader they say well how big is the check that i have to write and then we're good you know i i mean i that's harder to let go of if somebody is irresponsible and killed your child um but yeah you know, it, it's 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 a different culture and i mean you know you, you you i'm sure everybody thinks their culture is the best culture so it's also very um uh, depends on where you grew up yeah, yeah, and showing that understanding. The uh, okay, so what led you now from this into what you're doing now with business interrogation? Yeah, I think one of the things is I have huge curiosity, and that you know my my ability to quickly learn things and master them. I think one of the one of the things that I'd encourage people to do, and and it served me well, is as soon as I get assigned a role is I figure out what are all my responsibilities and then move outward from there. Why do I do task A? Oh, task A serves this team over here. 
and then understanding, well, what, what do they really need me to deliver will help me perform task A in an optimized way and better understand who they are and what they need so that as I run across opportunities, I can channel that to them. Um, I think even in the military, I was the person that they would send to do the tasks no one knew how to do because I was like a fire and forget missile system, right? You just aim specialist Sergeant Hammond at it and then they don't worry about it because they know that I'll figure out not just how to check the box and get it done, but figure out, okay, this is what really needs to happen here and make sure that everybody delivers what needs to happen. So that's really served me well, but what it does do is eventually I'll reach a ceiling where I have nothing else to learn. I know my job, the jobs of everyone around me, the jobs of everyone that I work with, and then I feel stuck and I start to look for something else. Uh, you know, I, I was working for a top 10 global bank. Uh, I taught myself cyber threat intelligence. So that was kind of my third Intel discipline. And, and I went from self-taught to sort of the lead analyst at the bank in three and a half years. And then I was like, now what? I trained by replacement. And then I was like, well, uh, they were doing cyber exercises. And so, you know, that's designing scenarios. I was doing that uh, as an instructor, uh, in, you know, in, in interrogation. I like building mousetraps and running people through and, and um again, really good at, um, I'd say what made me really good at, at that task is uh, cyber exercising is I was really good at identifying where the needs of the executive that we were serving, the needs of the cybersecurity perspective, and the needs of the business met. So I could design an exercise that would check as many boxes for as many people as possible. Um, and so, um, Eventually, I mastered that as well. I did a, an industry-level exercise for the financial services industry. That's the sign back here behind me, where uh, I, I facilitated an exercise in front of the Secretary of the Treasury. And so, you know, unless the president's going to come to an exercise, I don't know. I don't know how much higher I can go on that. And and I learned everything that I could learn um, uh, every year in that role, I was always asking, what's the biggest challenge for the team? And I was taken on that challenge year after year. So I continued to grow. And I, I think that's, that's the key for me is continuous growth, right? Figure out something new, something different. I took up bass guitar playing at age 50 and I play every, you know, at church on the weekends, um, you know, constant, constantly saying yes to things that, are, are challenging. Um, so that's, that's sort of where I, you know, I, I volunteer in an inner healing prayer ministry because I got a lot of value out of it. And so now I help, um, help people kind of sort out their, their past and, and get, put things to, to peace and, and, uh, built a nursing school in central Honduras with uh, a team of, you know, just, Everybody came together. We built built the school. It took us five years. We raised almost a quarter of a million dollars and built a modern facility that serves nursing students and uh, the local community with a clinic. So, wow. Okay. Yeah. I may have missed the, I may have missed the drives you. <laughs> I may have missed the question in there, Chris. So no. I, no. We, well, we we got to what drives you, and yeah. and I think it's pretty clear. Um, uh, because that was going to be one of the questions I threw back at you is which, what is important to you? Um, yeah. And, and making a difference. how would you answer that? Yeah. Making a difference. Uh, some, somebody asked me recently, what does success look like to you? And success to me is being able to kind of look back over my shoulder at my past and see uh, the people that I was able to help and serve. I, I feel like, you know, if I can give somebody a tool that helps them 10 X their future, um, you know, that's all I want to do is hand out tools. <laughs> so that's why I love business interrogation because a lot of times people, you know, they know they have a problem in their business, but they're busy and they don't have the time to really 
explore what that is. And sometimes that comes with a really, really high cost. If you've got a, if you've got a team member that's disrupting, you know, the peace within your organization, uh, you're paying a high, high cost for that. And so, um, sometimes that's, that's what it is. There's somebody who needs to be gone. Um, sometimes they have a critical role, so that makes it more painful because you've got to find somebody to replace them. Um, but again, for the good of your organization, you've got to take care of those things. Um, sometimes it's not being ready to get to the next level. There's something holding you back. You, lack of systems or um, lack of a, a key a key role. You know, you, you need to turn over the finances to a you know a, a financial officer or um, you know you you're your technology guy needs to stop working about worrying about all the technology and start leading the team of technology solvers, you know, whatever it is, there's usually, I, I guess, um, I see how things fit together and how those connections are. Uh, I, I used to say I can break anything because I see where the connections are weak and I care. I, you know, I, I keep asking questions until I understand how all the pieces fit together. And I don't really need to know what the processes are. I just need to know how the connections touch and what what's important in that connection. Gotcha. Okay. I can visualize that. Somebody so, called me a, a Swiss Army chainsaw once. <laughs> of a tool for, uh, uh, <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times when somebody is like, hey, we just want you to break this. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> you do oh, not my want goodness. Me to touch that. And then... You know, they they order me to do it and then I do it and then they're like, oh, my gosh, no, no, we can't have that. And I'm like, I told you that two months ago, 75 interviews ago, you know, because it, sometimes it's complicated. But I yeah. Mean, so I've got a business. I'm interested in what you do. Why would I? I mean, when somebody asks that question, why should we hire you? What do you answer that? Well, I ask. I like to. Ask, well, how is imp, how important is your success to you? I think is is one of the questions that I would ask. Um, I I I find problems. I anticipate problems, and I find hidden opportunities. So, um, you know, in, in the military, they say military intelligence is a force multiplier. I think that's what I am um, there. You know, uh, a lot of a lot of companies have sort of a visionary, uh, you know, founder and then sort of his, his COO, the the person who makes it happen. Um, and I I'm both of those things. You know, I, I, I get the visionary thing and I, I understand how to make it happen. I don't want to be I don't want to I don't want to be in either of those roles, but, you know, if you're trying to do something new, I can help pull that vision out of the visionary and add additional value to it. You know, see see some of the next level things that can be done as you're building out that new capability. And then I'm also able to help translate it to the implementer so that they understand, oh, this is what we're trying to accomplish and this is what it's going to lead us to. And these are the things that are important in that. And then also sometimes, you know, the implementer sees that, you know, the way we do business now isn't going to work with this new vision. You know, are you going to rip the company apart trying to make this happen? So I can also translate the concerns of the implementer back to the visionary so that we can go, well, let's, let's find a plan that doesn't put in risk the things that we do well while we build out this new capability to this new vision. And so, um, you know, ideally, you know, I don't, I don't, I would not be comfortable in a static role. I really like new challenges yeah. constantly, you know, and, um, you know, when I started off, I, you know, I call myself a cybersecurity consultant, but really I, I feel like I'm more of a strategic advisor. Uh, what do you want to accomplish? And, and let me help you dream that into existence and get a blueprint for what it looks like. Um, 
I did when I first started, I was doing, you know, cybersecurity consulting and um, effectively I designed uh, fictitious but realistic cyber scenarios, fire drills for your network to help you think through, well, what we, we do in a cyber disaster. Um, and then COVID hit. And I realized very quickly that nobody's going to hire me to build a fictitious disaster for them while they're in the middle of a real world disaster. And so um, I took that opportunity to grow myself. You know, I joined the John Maxwell team. I, I went through all of their leadership training. Uh, I started just reading personal growth, learning about running businesses, um, how to be more effective with my time, how to um, and, and I ended up also uh, doing a contract for a, a major financial institution. Um, it got qualified for Dan Sullivan's strategic coach program, which really helped up level, you know, how can I, you know, they, they, they have a, you, everybody has a unique ability and that's what do you do better than anyone else in the world? And um, I love unique ability collaborations. How can I take what I do and, you know, see how it energizes and synergizes with what you do so that we can serve our clients in new ways. And, and um, to that end, uh, you know, uh, one out of a partnership I had out of the nursing school project, uh, one of my, one of my, um, the leaders on the board with me was uh, Dr. Ted Anders. And he had a system called customer driven leadership uh, that he traveled all over the world and sort of helping organizations you know, that visionary leader, this is the company I want to run and, and getting that all the way down to the lowest level of the organization. So it's sort of bottom up, infuse the people with, Hey, this is the journey we're on to build this organization and then rewarding them through incentives when they help you achieve that growth. And so it, you know, I said, I could break anything. This is the one thing where I saw I can gum it up uh, for a month or two, but um, you know, after a month, you're going to have a report saying, here's your problem, fix this problem. And, and I don't see systems like that. Uh, in fact, I've never seen them until, up until that point. So we, we went into partnership. I helped him uh, write a book to tell the story about a system. And so that's another, another thing that falls under that business interrogation umbrella. So was there anything specific or what made Ted's system unbreakable gummable but unbreakable yeah um well you might be surprised it's a focus on what is important to the customer so that's where you start and it's and, and then um how do you want to grow I, i'd say that's the next most important thing being clear and living your values um having systems in place um because i think your ad hoc growth is is limited. You you can't you can't get to you know big business world if you haven't systematized what you do. Right? It should be a repeatable process, but it shouldn't be a static process. You should reflect and say, "Hey, yeah, we've got the systems in place, but how could they get better?" And and um, it it decentralizes, um, you know. There are some operating systems out there that are top down, right? I tell you what I want you to do and I tell my lieutenants and they tell their captains and they tell their, you know, whatever it is uh, all the way down. But it's it's very self-directed and then stuff gets lost in translation, right? When I tell somebody what I want, part of that is their interpretation of what I've said. It's the telephone game, right? Whereas yes. if everyone has clarity throughout the entire organization. This is what we're trying to achieve. If you make a decision based on helping us get there, then, you know, as long as you don't drive us into a ditch and part of it is defining, Hey, within this area, you have responsibility. If you have to cross one of these lines to solve the problem, right? You, you can't write a million dollar check to solve a $5 problem, right? That's really bad for business. Um, but then within the team, so uh, you, you, you ask each team or function within the organization, how do you serve the other functions? And then you ask the teams that you serve, 
how what's the one thing I can do to help you serve your client the better internal or or the final external client and then you just work on getting better and better at that and you're doing that one percent growth over every connection within the organization month over month um, and then as you master that, you add, what's the second most important thing? What's the third most important thing? Uh, and so it's a system that empowers. Uh, it's like each function becomes an entrepreneurial problem solving solution, right? They're getting better and better at serving their internal clients, which helps you serve the external clients better. Um, and everybody's evaluated by who they serve. So instead of the team leaders telling the you know worker bees, you know, what grade did you get this year? Uh, it's the team leader says, I'm going to make this commitment to the team. And then they're evaluated by the team. Did they do what they said they were going to do to help the team be successful? So effectively, the, the, the leader and the, the leader of the team and the team share a score. 70% uh, of, of their score comes from what they do together. And then the leader gets scored for how well they served their team, how well they prom did what they said they were going to do. And then the team, their 30% additionally is how do we score each other? So if you and I were on a team, I would tell, and it's only two things. Where did, if I'm evaluating you, where did you not live up to the values of the organization? Or where did you not, where are you not a good team member? What are you doing that's hurting the team? And so that feedback comes to you, it hurts your score, but you know what you have to do to be a better teammate. And so it's constant improvement everywhere. And the same thing with the leader, they know where they missed the mark. So it's a, it's a, it creates a self-evolving system. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. And then even just that emphasis on the teamwork, because now it really forces you to start thinking as, a member of a team instead of just it you know let's face it most businesses it's just a word it's a it's a term you don't really think about the team aspect of it this really forces the issue i completely agree one of my favorite examples is let's say you have a sales team and if you and i are on a sales team together and i have a secret that helps me close 20 percent more sales you think i'm gonna share that with anybody else on the team <laughs> Because what's important to me in that environment is I want to be the best salesperson on the team. That's what's going to score me points to get me, you know, compensation. When I go on vacation, am I going to hand over my lead list to you so you can start working my leads? Heck no, right? I mean, that's just the reality. <laughs> but in this system, since we're all scored together, now that 20% secret I have is something I want the rest of the team to have. Because when we're all more successful, we all will get more of the incentive payments. And so um, it really helps us help each other get better. Oh, I love that. Now, in the, you know, you've gone and well, you've done this for so many different businesses now. What are some of the common problems or issues that you see in businesses? Um, yeah, I, I think... A lot of them, especially small and medium sized business, they don't have enough systems in place. And and, um, you know, if you're if you're not clear in how you serve your customers throughout what we call the value chain, right, which is team A serving team B serving team. If I'm just making that stuff up myself, it's a lack of clarity. Right. And when you have that full picture, um, it it changes everything. So, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that I like to say is let's say that, you know, I'm part of the product, I'm the manager for the production team. Right. And so if I just make the assumption that, Hey, if we can increase our production by 10%, that's, what's going to help the company. And so we just start, I start, you know, <laughs> being a taskmaster on my teams and for, you know, getting them to push out more and more with, without connecting and going, do we need higher production, right? Because when you start pushing your people, quality starts to drop off, right? Now, so now we're getting more returns and more customer complaints and our reputation is, is suffering on, on you know, 
uh, like Yelp or Amazon or wherever we're selling, right? And so, uh, or let's say that I fill up the warehouse and now all of a sudden we find there's a, a glitch or a bug in, in the system that we have and we have to fix it. And so now we've got all of this bug stuff that we've created because we overproduced without thinking about the consequences. And so um, I just, I think that having the systems in place where there's monitoring, where, where you're not producing stuff that the company doesn't need. I mean, if you're, you know, getting ready for the Christmas rush, obviously, you know, Black Friday, but, uh, you know, you want to have a strategic plan and you want the system, the systems in place to support that. The next I would say is not enough investing in growth of your people and of your leadership. And, and honestly, of, all the way up to the senior leadership, uh, coaching is, is, is critical. Um, I mean, if if you're not growing, you're sort of in a quagmire. And so, um, you know, that could be I mean, there's a lot of ways to grow. Right. You can be part of communities of entrepreneurs where you're cross sharing information and things like that. Or, you know, having a business coach that's asking you and helping you create a strategic plan for your future or hiring people to help you put the systems in place, uh, hiring your your people to focus on. Uh, what what are the communication challenges? Having having a specific assessment that the whole organization shares, whether it's DISC, Colby, uh, Strength Finders, um, YOS, you know, there's 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 a lot of things out there where all of a sudden we have a deeper understanding of each other and how to best communicate with each other. Any 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 kind of investments like that, I think, just pay gold and they help uh, your your team feel like you're invested in their success, which increases their loyalty and and their fulfillment in being uh, in being part of your team. We we have a client that's been running CDL for over 25 years, and um, they said that you know they grew from nine people when Ted first introduced the system to them to over 300. And, and the CEO of that company said, we had a 20 year period where we only had five people quit to go work someplace else. Oh, wow. It's, you know, <laughs> you, you find a place where they treat you with respect and they value your contribution. Um, who, who, who wouldn't want to work in a, in a company like that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that because we often talk about finding the right person for the right seat. We talk about, the you know the hiring process making sure we're we're finding good people uh but i have seen often where it's completely neglected to turn them into sure they need to have the raw material of their character and work ethic and some of those things but i remember many times where i was in a position where i just wish somebody would have invested something in me yeah. to become better at what i was doing which I know would have made me want to do even better because of that trust and that, that concern for, for me. And yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because it, I see that way too often where it is a problem and it's not done correctly. And, and one of the other biggest mistakes I've seen is hiring from the outside when you, when you haven't assessed the ta talent from within. Uh, because you're you're rolling the dice, right? You you don't typically know what is this person going to bring. Um, and you know, I've seen somebody. Uh, I competed for a role uh, where you know it was one of those corporate games where they already know who they want to hire, but they've got to post the job. And of course, they don't tell you, hey, you're not going to get this job even if you apply. Uh, and I made it through four interviews before they finally went with the guy they were always planning to go with. And, you know, but I, I did my research and I had a plan and I knew how to drive that. And the person came from the outside. They didn't understand our culture. They didn't know how everything worked. And I, I don't know that they accomplished much in that first year that they were there, whereas I was ready to drive that train from day one. So, you know, and and then how do I feel? You know, I'm like, I know I'm competitive. You know, I know I know what they want, 
better than anybody they could be talking to. So why, why am I not being considered for this position? And, you know, eventually somebody said, yeah, we already knew who we were hiring before. So oh my goodness. It's, it's, it's destroys morale though. It's, it's. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm sure other people found out that that's how they were operating and it, there's the distrust. You know, all of a sudden you can't trust really anything that, yeah. that they're saying. Um, the okay so improving a business there is clearly fixing these problems taking care of them but on the other side what are some things that a business can do and i'm going to use the word improve not grow not scale improve as a business yeah um one of the one of the things that I call it kicking the tires, right? Um, have somebody that can ask you questions about, you know, what you're doing and how you're delivering periodically. That could be a coach, a mentor, and that's, you know, at the senior leadership level, right? You know, if yeah, the CEO shouldn't be above learning and, and getting coached and getting, you know, advice. I mean, even if you're, even if you're a fortune 50 company, you think those guys, uh, th those men and women aren't invested in continuing to grow and talk to other people who, I mean, that's, you know, that's how you grow. And, and I think, um, I think that a couple of things, I think if it, once you get and your business is successful, um, if you just keep running the way you're running, eventually changes in the market will disrupt you. Whereas you should be looking for ways you can disrupt the market because then you'll be, or, or at least considering what could happen. That was kind of my cybersecurity stuff, right? Um, sure. Everything's working now, but what if you get hacked? And if you haven't thought through that, if you, if you don't know, is there a circumstance where I would pay a ransom to unlock my computer systems, right? then you're making that decision under the gun. So, you know, I really like, um, you know, a lot of times people want to hire people that, you know, either call them yes people or call them uh, go with the flow, don't rock the boat people. But if, if everybody in your company is afraid to rock the boat, you're going to, you're going to run aground, I, I think. And, and so, um, you need people challenging you. Uh, maybe that's a function within your organization that just goes around and checks, well, how can we make things better? Um, maybe it's asking your customers. Some Your customers' needs change. So if you're delivering to them today the way that they wanted you to deliver to them five years ago, somebody else is going to find a better way to deliver. And so, again, uh, that would be one of the things the the other is um you know if you're if you're growing um i think one of the mistakes is uh business leaders patch symptoms within their business instead of drilling into what's the root cause and a lot of times those patches are more expensive than solving the problem cuz they don't you know Great, you you've made it go away for you <laughs> at the top, but it didn't solve anything for people dealing with the problem, right? And and that again, it could be somebody who's a bad fit for the culture of the business, who's in a leadership position, destroying morale on his team or her team, or and and all of the people that they work with, you know, or or it could be a system that just doesn't serve anymore and that needs to be looked at again. So uh, those are those are sort of, you know, I'm definitely I will never be happy in a business that's stagnant, you know. Yeah, um, I, I'm a disruptor. You know, that's the success. The Secrets of Disruptors is one of the books I've been a contributing author, author to. And, and, you know, part of that is don't get comfortable. My, my chapter is let's let's get uncomfortable. And whether you're a business leader or that's in your personal life. Uh, sometimes you got to pick up a bass guitar and figure out how to do that. So keep praying. So when you, 
I'm trying to think of how to put this. So what are one of the things that you tell people uh, to do? Like before the, I mean, let's say they're not even considering working for you and they're just like, what's something that we should be focusing on? I mean, you've listed many things already, so maybe that's not even the, the best question to be asking. Well, here's the question I like to challenge um, entrepreneurs with is, are you asking your customers, especially the most important customers, what's the one thing that I can deliver for you that if I get that right, you will forgive a lot of other stuff and never look to go find somebody else that does what I do? What is success? What is the most important components of success for you? What kind of answers do you get? Not like specifically, but what's the the theme behind it? Uh, I think I think a lot of business owners are making assumptions about what their customers want without ever asking them, "What do you want?" Um, you know, I I can if you hire me, for example, to do a cyber exercise for your leadership team, um, but I see that one person on the team, maybe even in the planning of the, of the exercise is toxic to your, to your team, to, to, you know, the success of your business. Do you want me to just ignore that? Or do you, do you want me at least to bring it that to your attention? Right. But if you, but if you aren't, if you aren't looking for what else, what other that's in, you know, in, in the interrogation business, it's like if 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 I ask you a question, you know, what's your priority? And you say it's this and I just go, OK, well, that's all Chris cares about. I haven't done a good job. Right. At, well, what other priorities do you have, Chris? And then you tell me two more. And if I don't ask, well, what else do you care about until I understand? OK, this is what success looks like to Chris and I, I hear from business owners, oh, I just lost my biggest client. Sometimes that's great for you. Maybe that's maybe that's a disruption your business needs, but uh, let it be because you chose that they were not a good fit or that you are serving other people in other directions, not because you weren't doing what they needed you to do. Don't get blindsided by that. Okay, that's a good one. Um, okay, then why do you do what you do as uh, in business interrogation? Um, for, for four years as an entrepreneur, I've been growing my network and meeting entrepreneurs from all over the world. And I care about them. And I will often ask them, because I care, you know, what's going on in your business or what's the biggest challenge facing you right now? And then I'll ask some questions about it. And um, a lot of times they'll get clarity. Um, sometimes the, they will realize. I had one time where I was on with an entrepreneur that's exited several successful businesses. They were creating a new business and I asked them five questions and I broke their business model. And they were like, uh, you know, I was like, but what if they don't do that? <laughs> and they were like, oh, oh, that would be bad. That would be really bad. And so they came back and they said, you know, hey, I'm going to fix this. And then I'm going to come back and I want to ask you again. And the next time we talked, we talked for two hours and they had their entire process documented. And I just they said, ask me anything. And we just went through their entire process. And I go, well, what if this happens? And how would you handle this? And what if what if this occurs? What's your next step? And who would handle that? And just, you know, really went in. And I would say in that two hours, they got at least seven to 10 good aha moments, you know, where they're like, oh, that's good. That's important. And, and then, you know, that was probably the most fun I've had as an entrepreneur, just, you know, and, and they left with greater clarity. And again, I didn't do anything for them. I mean, I just asked them the questions that they had to consider answers to. And so if I could do that for the rest of my life, and I'm not planning on retiring, so 
you know, for me, it's it's finding those right fit entrepreneurs that are trying to change the world, uh, you know, getting on retainer with a couple of those really big, you know, where, you know, I may serve a, a small or medium sized business once a year coming in, asking them some questions, challenging them. But, you know, there's entrepreneurs that own five, 10 businesses where they're constantly innovating all over the place. And I would love to, you know, be on three or four calls a week with people like that that are, you know, creating. I think I think entrepreneurs um, create value for the world, and uh, especially when they do it ethically, which I think most most of the ones that I've met do. Um, and and so by helping them be successful, you sort of push back against chaos, uh, dysfunction, and you make the world a better place. So. It makes a lot of sense too, especially given the background of how how quickly you learn and then how quickly you get bored. But something like this, it's like you can't get bored because it's always something new, always a new company, a new group of people, a new set of processes, a new model. Uh, yeah, keeps. I life. would imagine. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So. Uh, how does somebody learn? Let's say they want to learn more about customer driven leadership. Yeah. Where do you send them to learn more about that? Um, well, I mean, if, it depends on the level of understanding they want. If they want a kind of a summary, I'll, 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 there's some podcasts where I go into pretty good detail on that. Um, our book is on Amazon, it's also on Audible. So, Customer Driven Leadership Legacy Edition. There's also a customer driven leadership implementation guide uh, guidebook. I would only recommend that for people who want to try to self implement. Um, if you're going to work with us and our team uh, to implement, uh, we'll provide those for you. Um, but, you know, effectively, it's a complicated enough process <laughs> that I will map <laughs> that I've mapped it out for people. Uh, again, I don't, it, it would, at this point in time, Ted and I are the only people that can lead as CDL implementation effectively, I think. Um, but we have plans. Uh, we have some CDL implementers that are sort of in the apprentice phase that we're developing, right? To So that, um, you know, again, it's that how do you plan to grow? Um, and, you know, Ted and I don't want to travel all over the world for the rest of our lives. We want to teach other people how to do that. And again, uh, it, it creates more winning. It creates more uh, positive impact for the world. So we're definitely looking to multiply. And then, and then, um, really, uh, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Tell me you're interested about customer driven leadership or business interrogation. You know, I I, I want it. Uh, I'm I'm business interrogation will be my f uh, first solo book. Um, that I've written. Uh, I wasn't an author a year and a half ago, and uh, I've already uh, contributed to five books. And so uh, I've got two more in the pipeline. I, I, I will probably have potentially seven books out by in two years. So, um, so if somebody's eagerly looking forward to uh, the business interrogation book, how long do they have to wait? Um, I'm, I'm gathering case studies till the end of the year. Um, and then uh, I will build that into the book, uh, share some of my real world interrogation experience, uh, some of my life lessons where I learned um, what questions to ask, really. You know, I mean, I, I'm i a fast learner, but a late bloomer. So, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, you know I, I came to kind of, I'm constantly trying to improve how well I serve, but uh, I would say more recently, really looking to grow my capabilities in, you know, how well I serve and who I can serve. And so, um, I mean, I'm looking for businesses to interrogate now. So reach out on LinkedIn and uh, it's a 20 minute process. I'll set up a 30 minute call so we can, you know, have a little pregame, postgame analysis. Um a little rapport building if needed. If you, you get on the call and you're like, why did I just agree to be interrogated? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I, I had a fantastic feedback from a, a, a client 
uh, today, as a matter of fact, and they were like, you know, when I got on, I was, you know, really intimidated, but it was a gentle process. I learned a lot. We, we, you know, the perspective really helped. And so far I've asked everybody at the end of an interrogation is, you know, how valuable is this to you? Cause it's not about me. It's about, did you get value out of it? And so far everybody has, has verbally affirmed that it was of high value. So if you can use high value analysis in your biggest business challenge, um, over a 20 minute minute period, um, take the time and let's, let's talk. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. This is a lot of, uh, a very valuable information. I think anybody who's in business will get a lot just from listening to this, let alone what they could get either from the book or books or talking to you personally. And do you said you had a podcast as well? Oh, I've been on a lot of podcasts. I've been on podcasts. I don't want to be in charge of anything, Chris. That's my goal in life. <laughs> Call me when you need me and let me serve well for as long as I need. Yeah. You've done pretty well so far. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate you. Thanks for listening to Pivot Perspectives with your host, Chris O'Byrne. Please leave your feedback and visit strategicadvisorboard.com to get the latest and greatest business advice on the planet. Follow us on social media for updates, and we will see you on the next episode.